Hey, welcome to this week's sermon. I am so glad that you are here. No matter if you're usual or somebody sent you the link, I believe that God has a message just right for your life at this time. Hey, I wanna let you know that this is a series that is going to help you win in relationship. And if you wanna take that to another level in resource, I wanna let you know, Relationship Goals is still out everywhere. The book as well as the study guide. And for everybody who's already gotten it, thank you for being a part of changing the world. For everybody who has not bought this from somebody else, they need this in their life. And if you've never heard of Relationship Goals, this book was written to help you win in relationships. I'm telling you that God cares about every one of your relationships and we wanna help you win. So this sermon is about to give you revelation. Get ready as we go into this week's sermon. Ooh, I'm ready. Yup. I hope you prayed this morning because I believe that God wants to speak specifically to you. And um, I want to give everybody um, the opportunity to just ground yourself. Come on right now. I need everybody to just take a deep breath in. Come on. Now let it out. I see you in Kansas and in Texas and in England and in Africa, wherever you're watching from. I want you to take a deep breath in. Now let it out. Because today we're talking about sex. (laughs) Glory to God. Y'all thought we was going to go through relationship goals reloaded and not talk about sex? The reason we have to talk about this is because the church is way too silent on something that God created. And and this is that one thing I'm going straight in. So if you don't have your notes ready, I need you to go because we're on week nine of a series that we're calling Relationship Goals Reloaded. I need everybody to know I only got two messages left this one and next week. And I'm coming with everything that I have because I believe that the culture has tried to hijack something it did not create. The culture has tried to make everybody think that it invented sex, that sex was something that is supposed to be nasty, it's supposed to be um, covered, it's supposed to be something we don't really talk about, it's supposed to be something that we can sneak and see on, on, on movie channels and, uh, and on websites, but the church is not supposed to take, talk about it. I am standing in the authority that God has given me today, and I'm about to talk about sex in a manner that gives God glory and makes the devil look dumb. I'm telling you right now that there's been too many of us that have been hidden under this cloud of sex and how it's been defined and everything that's evil about it. But I want you to know that Trey Songs did not invent sex, even though he made a song that said he did. Sexy was not lost. Justin Timberlake said he was bringing it back. Marvin Gaye said that he was providing sexual healing, but still there's so many people sexually broken. What I wanted to tell you today is God God invented sex. Top, type that in the chat. That's one you ain't never put in there before. God invented sex. Pastor Mike, why are you talking about this so? Like I have my kids in here. They're, 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 they're in middle school and, 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 and elementary. They already know. Like if we want to be honest about this thing, they already know. Do you know the statistics tell us real quick because the God only reveals things in spirit and in truth. He, he, he wants us to be in spirit, but he wants us to have truth and he wants us to counteract the, the truth with the spirit of God. The truth is, I need everybody to hear me, 70, 50% of all high school students will have a sexual interaction before graduating high school. That's one out of two. So look around. If there's two of y'all, one of y'all sexually active before you get out of high school. Pastor Mike, you shouldn't say that. That might give them ideas. Instagram's already given them ideas. <laughs> They're cousins that you invite over and they play so well together. You think they play in house? Some of my first sexual experiences were with my cousins. I'm t- I want to pull the sheet back. Because we sit here like we cannot be able to talk about the things that God created and then it gives the enemy the opportunity to mess with generations of people in secret. 
in the dark. But we learned on the first week of this series that wherever there is knowledge, that's light. There's understanding. But wherever there is a lack of knowledge or darkness or ignorance, that's where the enemy's able to rule. And I'm here with a floodlight today. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit on your life and your family to shine a light so that we can see this topic of sex in the way that it was intended. 50% of all high school students will have a sexual activity before they graduate high school. It's even a worse statistic for African Americans. 78% of African American high school students will have a sexual encounter before they graduate high school. 78%. It's 52% for Hispanics and 43% or 47% for white people. Yay, white people. (laughs) I always say that. Good job, guys. Um, The reason I have to talk about this is because if I don't, then who will? I need to redeem this idea of sex real quick because if if you grew up in the youth group that I grew up in, the only relational advice that I ever got about sex or relationship, period, the reason I wrote relationship goals is because this is all I got. Don't have sex. Finish it before you get married. We went to the same youth group. And and what ended up happening was that was an incomplete instruction. It was with good intention, but there was not enough information. And what happens when I I was at my friend's house late night and the the movie channels, it went from Transformers to to something completely different. What happened when I was looking for uh, um, the tissue at at, at the house and there was magazines under there? What happened if I was abused or touched illegitimately? And when things were awakened and aroused and I wasn't even in control of it, I was in a place where I was supposed to be with people who would protect me and they took advantage of me. What happens with this idea? And what I want to do today is I want to redeem it. I want to let you know because I thought for so many years sex was bad. Sex was evil. Sex was something that was not supposed to be done except in a back room with two adults that really didn't enjoy it. And we sell all of these lies to young people and all this other stuff. But I came to tell you the truth. Point number one, sex is good. I feel the spirit right now. Sex is good. Say that out of your mouth. Everybody say it. Sex is good. Good. Some of y'all are turning pink. Others of y'all ashy around the mouth. You stick, uh, you, you uh, stiff necked right now because this has never been addressed in church. But I promise you, more than half of the things people are coming to the altar for, and more than half of the things that we're counseling people out of, have some tie to some type of sexual perversion. I'm trying to go for the root of the thing today. Sex is good. Why is sex good, Pastor Mike? Many reasons, but the first one is because sex was God's idea. I'm take, sex is not the culture's idea. Sex is not something that, it, that is um, um, man-made. Sex was divinely created by the creator. Now, I want you to think of that in contrast to everything that you've thought about sex. This was made by God for his children to enjoy within the right context. Let me prove it to you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. I need to set some foundation so that you can know what this is, where it's supposed to go, and how you're supposed to use it. It says, then God blessed them. This is Adam and Eve in the garden. And it said, look at the first commandment to man ever. Be fruitful and multiply. This was not an agricultural term. He wasn't telling them, go plant some seeds. Let me give you the remix version of this. He said, y'all blessed because I made you in my image. Adam, go put it down, bro. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. This is what God intended for it to be. And that's why in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, then Jesus is talking to us. And look, he gives us more clarity. He says, but God made. Who made? I said, who made it? God made. God made them male and female. He's given parameters. God made our parts. He knows our desires. He knows our urges. He knows our appetites. He made them. Somebody said God made it. 
Okay, I need you to get this because I'm trying to undo many decades for many of us of wrong thinking and bad theology. Sex is good because it's sex was God's idea and God made it. Verse 7, it says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and they get married. And watch this, and is joined. I want you to underline, I want you to circle, I want you to make it big in your notes, that word joined. Because I begin to study this in the original language and it means so much more than the word when we say it. When we say joined, it's like, oh yeah, they just came together. No, 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 no. Joined has a threefold meaning in this context. They are joined physically through the act of sex. They're joined emotionally through closeness or intimacy and they're joined spiritually through covenant. Every time somebody is joined or has sex, it is not just a physical experience. This is an emotional and spiritual connecting. And that's why you haven't been able to figure out why that one night stand when I was tripping on my birthday, you know what I'm saying? And you can't get that dude off your mind and you can't get that girl out of, out of your head. It's because you weren't just joined to them physically. The Lord said when y'all came together and did a sacred act, you joined together emotionally and spiritually. Uh-huh. That's why you're in a relationship with them, but you're still thinking about them. <laughs> That's why you keep claiming we're happy, but you can't get them out of your mind. It was because that joining together didn't just stop when you left the house. When you creeped out in the morning, something was stuck to you. Let me stop. I got to stay focused. See, the thing that you got to realize is that we think God recognizes marriage when we do the, the wedding and we have the, the, the food and we have the white dress and the tuxedo. That's not when God recognizes a marriage. The Bible tells us that God recognizes a marriage when that man and that woman comes together to consummate that marriage or to connect or be joined into one. This is so deep that if you study the thing out that God has so divinely orchestrated a woman's body to have a, a piece of that body be called the hymen that is actually for storing blood, that when there's a covenant made, if you study it in the Old Testament and the New Testament, anytime a covenant is made, there has to be bloodshed. So God said, when a man and a woman come together and are joined, I'm going to put something in a woman that when they come together, there has to be bloodshed because every time they connect there has to be a covenant and when there is a covenant and bloodshed that is the thing that secures them forever together and what you got to understand is this is the same principle that God uses in the Old Testament when the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt all of the men had to get circumcised because there needed to be bloodshed to so that that was the old covenant but this is the new covenant can I bring it up to the New Testament for you when God was separated from humanity and we needed to be joined back to him. He sent Jesus and he went to a cross because there had to be bloodshed. And when there was bloodshed, I'm feeling happy already. When there was bloodshed, there was a new covenant made, a better covenant where we don't have to sacrifice goats and lambs, but where the eternal lamb was sacrificed for us. God does not want us to just have a connection. He wants us to be in covenant. And that's why when you have sex with somebody, God says, oh, they do. Wow. Wow. Every time I have sex with somebody, they're making a commitment to be in covenant. Wow. I do. No wedding, no dress, no songs, but in your apartment, in them queen size bed with the dirty sheets, I do in the back of the car when nobody you think is looking. I do. Sneaking out of the office and going into the secretary's room. I do. And how many of us are married without the covenant? How many people have we said I do to, but you really didn't? And what happens is we keep moving through life trying to act like we're not tied to anything. 
that we don't have any, any um, emotional baggage or we don't have anything that's keeping us back. But God said, you are taking what I have called sacred and you're throwing it to culture to give you your playbook. But today, God has sent me as a messenger to be able to let you know that sex is good. Sex was God's idea. Sex is the thing that he wants you to enjoy inside of the right container. But you cannot have God's results without God's rules. They tune it off, Charles. But it's okay. They can go and keep having those broke relationships that they keep trying to form through a so sexual tie. And they're going to go from cycle to cycle. Do you wonder why everybody that you date is the same person with a different face? And they all end around the same time of year because now you give them their body because you're really interested in them. And after they have to stop pursuing you because you'll just give it up, there is no more interest in you. And now you get out of it trying to fill the hole that is in the inside of you. You, and you somehow find the same person with a different last name. Oh, I'm talking. Some of y'all, the past decade of your life has been the same story, different face. Same story, different face. And today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm coming to yank some of y'all out of this cycle. The cycle, I feel the presence of God. My help is come. The cycles that have been keeping you down, that have been keeping you distracted, that have been keeping you under wraps. Today, God says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Somebody shout in the chat, say freedom. That's what God wants for all of his children. He wants us to walk in freedom. But you cannot walk in freedom if you don't understand truth. And the truth is, sex is glue. The easiest way that I could display it is anytime you have sex, the goal is to make whoever is having sex be stuck together forever. Now, I know we don't look at it that simply. That's why we do one night stands and Netflix and chill. And what you up doing right now? What you got going? Are you tripping? I'll come over and put it down. Are you playing? You don't even want none of this. You know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody been able to. And you do all that dumb stuff. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be glued to her, to be glued to him. That is what the act is doing. And what happens is it looks like this. I think this would be simple for everybody to understand. Sex comes into the picture. We take all of our issues, all of our desires, all of our wants, all of our one night stands, all of our connections. We come with all of our baggage and all the abuse and the stuff we haven't told anybody. We come with that website we looked at and those fantasies that we dreamed up and all of those things. And then we get with somebody that's just as broken. They go to church though. <laughs> And they read their Bible, and they on, they on a streak on their Bible reading plan. He a man of God, except after 11 o'clock when stuff starts changing. And he went from watching cartoons to, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. And the situation is right, and they take you out to dinner, and they do a couple of things that make you feel special. You ain't never met a man like this. And no girl understand me like this, bro. She like wear J's and she likes shorts and like, and she love investments. And so that one night when everything is right and everybody's out of town and it just, it's raining outside and it's kind of cold and she got a snuggy blanket. And, and I was going to go back to my apartment, but it's late. Well, these are all the things that people say. I've never felt like this about anybody before. And what happens is that sex is supposed to join the two together forever. But I'm in college, so you know what I'm saying? I can't really settle down. You know what I'm saying? I'm actually like on my way to being a billionaire and a music producer. So I can't really, you know what I'm saying, be tied down. But we have something special though. But maybe five years from now when I settle down and you know what I'm saying, finish showing my wild oats, then maybe, I, cause you the one girl, you the one, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanna let you know I got you saved in my phone as the one. And all of these mental and emotional and manipulative games that get played. 
And then what ends up happening is you're like, I'm done with it. I don't want to do this anymore. And you try to rip apart. The problem is when you rip apart, when you were always supposed to be glued together, it will never look like what it looked like in the beginning. And there will always be pieces of you on pieces of me. And I wasn't insecure until after I got with you. And that insecurity transferred to me. And I used to be so confident in what God called me to do. But now there's pieces of you ah, that got off on me. I used to be so faith-filled. I used to be so optimistic. I used to want something in life. And now I just want you. Even when you told me that you don't want me, this process over and over and over and over again is how people then say, I want my husband or my wife to marry me. Think about doing this process over and over again. By the end of that process, this may be the only thing that's left of you. And that's why people say marriage is not a 50-50 partnership. It's 100-100. But when you keep giving pieces of yourself away, you're only 10% now. You can post like you, uh -huh. you can act like you still whole, but half of you is with Jerome. The other half of you is Sheila. The other pieces of you are, uh -huh, are with everybody that never had an investment in your future and you were not safe in the covenant and the confines of marriage. And now you're walking around with pieces of you. The reason I'm telling you this strongly is because when God said this thing, when God set this thing up in Mark chapter 10, in verse 8, it says, and the two are to be united into, everybody say one. I said, say one. He wanted the two people every time sex happened to be united deeper and closer into one since they, and, and I love the Bible because it, the Bible is really for remedial people like myself because I start asking questions like, okay, what did you really mean by when they joined, you know what I'm saying, into one? Does one count if it's oral sex or if it's masturbation or if it's this and that? And we start trying to do all of these things. He said, Michael, the two, so it can't be three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, okay, let me leave that alone. Because some of your fantasies have, have, have thought that more can satisfy you more. And all it does is it's more people you would be glued to, to be able to people to rip. Uh, okay. He said, so the two are to be, everybody shot at me, one. And then he gives a guarantee of what will happen if pe two people decide. He said, let no one split apart what God has joined together. It was never supposed to be pulled apart. That's why God says that when you have sex, you should save that until marriage. And I am so grateful that I'm getting to share this with you because nobody shared to me the why we don't have sex before we get married. They just told me not to. They didn't tell me why. The why you don't have sex before you get married is because when you take the sex outside of the container of marriage, you have the opportunity to damage more than you do help more. I think about it. Put that point up there. I'm out of order right now, but the marriage container is sex. I want, I, the, the, no, no, excuse me. Sex has a marriage container and the container is marriage. And when you put it in the container, that container can be able to be the most beautiful thing in the whole world. How do you know, Pastor Mike? I got three kids, a fine wife, and a lot of practice. Do you hear what I'm saying? But that same thing outside of the container can destroy tons of stuff. I don't know if you have the picture of water. Do you have that picture of water? Put that up here. This is what it reminds me of, and I want to show you an example of this. This on the right or the left is a picture of water that is in a container. This water in a container is rushing through these things that are creating electricity, and this water in the right container, millions of gallons of it, is bringing life and light to everybody around it. But that same water outside of a container is bringing devastation to everything it touches. I'm preaching right now. 
And even when the water recedes or you get out of the relationship or you think you're healed, there's still mildew from the dough. There's still residue and residual from what was done. All I'm telling you is the reason why marriage is so important is when you put sex inside of the marriage container, it protects you and everybody else. But I don't get that on my mic. Like, if God's so good, why did he even give me this sexual urge before? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like maybe if he just did it on my wedding day and then I felt all of this. Listen, it's not how it works. The greatest thing that God gave you is choice. And to be able to stay pure and to be able to make a life of discipline and to get stronger, you're going to have to choose to invite God into your everyday life. Not every week life, not every month life, not every year life. Your everyday life, can I take it? Every moment life. That you can have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you be able to manage every urge, every desire, and be able to do what God's called you to do. That's why he said, I made this. It's good. It's great. Great, but it's made for a container where two people are joined together to become, everybody say one. And that's why you got to understand that this is not just about sex and relationships. This is about God's plan of one for every person. Write this down. God's plan of one. It's to have one God, one man, one woman, one marriage, one sex partner, one flesh, one lifetime, one picture. That's what he wants. He wants your life, your relationship, your sex life to reflect as a picture what heaven looks like on earth. But until you get the God's principle of one, if you buy into what culture says about it, that's what happened to me. Me and Natalie were together. And we hadn't had sex for four or five years. We had dibbled and dabbled and touched stuff and rubbed stuff and did all that other stuff. I'm just going to be transparent with you right now because ain't no sense in faking at this current moment. And we were dibbling and dabbling and dry humping and, and, and touching stuff and doing all this other stuff. And then culture came in. And culture came in to say, bro, how you, how you going to settle down with one person and you ain't never seen what's out there? God had given me a promise at 15, 16 years old that was untouched, undefiled, was all mine. And I traded in a treasure for a try. And I wonder how many people out here are trading in the treasure that God's given you to try things that may or may not fulfill you. And that's why I'm coming to you today and talking to you with such a passion because if somebody would have got up and talked to me like this, it would have saved me so much hurt, so much time, so much pain I caused other people. And y'all be like, this is for the young people. This is for the young people. What are old people? They're young people that got older. And if these things and cycles haven't changed in you, you can be sitting up there in your house at 56 years old, you nasty old man, looking at all of these people and all of these things. Well, I didn't do nothing. The Bible tells you if you think the thoughts, you might have as well have done it because your heart is allowing you to go to a place that you have not let God touch. I hate how people get so religious over this topic. Well, I'm married. You can be impure in your marriage. You can be in an emotional affair with somebody on Facebook that you ain't never met before, but you think things about them that you never think about your wife. You make more time to make sure you logged on than laying with and finding about the woman that you said before God you were going to take care of. Pastor Mike, why are you coming this hard? Because I'm sick of the enemy. Playing with people's minds, marriages, and the future generations. The broken relationships are the only thing that the children can eat from. So if the mom and dad, whether you're together, it's baby mama drama, it was a one night stand, I should have aborted you, it was abuse, all of these things, it doesn't matter how it happens if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to come in and sever and cut and restore and heal and change, we pass that on to the next generation. And if you're not going to get sexually pure for yourself, by God, do it for your children. 
We're living in the most fatherless generation ever. No examples and models. But they know that you're going out for the weekend with your girls. They know what that means, mom. <laughs> ah! I'm praying that the Holy Spirit right now is going through this technology and it's grabbing people's hearts. And that you would get in a place where you would know that what you've seen about sex, what you've experienced about sex may not be God's best for you. See, the thing that I want you to write this down is sex has been perverted. It's been perverted, y'all. The enemy's job is to take whatever God says is good and make you think it's bad. All the way from the very beginning. Think about it, Adam and Eve in the garden. God says, you can't eat of one tree, not a whole field of trees, not the whole forest. He said, the whole forest is for you to enjoy. Just don't eat of this one tree. What did the enemy do? And I want you to see how cunning this is because the enemy wants to break God's plan of one. Remember, the two are supposed to be one. And so we never hear about the enemy or the devil or Satan in the garden when it was just Adam. We do not know how long it was before God gave Adam Eve, but you never hear about the devil until there was unity. And he said, where I see unity, I got to break it up. And he comes in the, ah, uh, he comes in the form of a manipulative snake and he starts whispering, not to both of them, to one of them. Die vision. And he whispers to one to pervert what God said. And she saw it, she tasted it, she touched it. And this is the crazy thing about being in a sexual or a temptation or, or any of those things is when you get to it, you always want to share it. Eve tasted what God told them not to taste and then took it to Adam and said, um, I ain't going to feel guilty by myself. Let me, let me put it in to terms. This is our last time. So since it's our last time, let's make it count. I'm moving after this. So you want to hook up one more time? You want to share the dysfunction with somebody else. And that's what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to pervert what God calls good. And this is the great thing for us. If we read the Bible as believers, this ain't new. This has been happening for years. Paul was in a situation where he was having to go through the same thing in the city of Corinth. It's like the Las Vegas strip of our time. And y'all know what they say in Vegas. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And half of y'all ain't even been to Vegas. So you already know the, like, like, you know the slogan and been there. And so 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul's telling these people, he said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not, everybody say will not, inherit the kingdom of God. I love this part. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself that you're going to get all the king's resources, relationship, responsibility, and the rest of the kingdom, and you're not doing it the way he's doing it. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself that you can keep going out here and sleeping with everybody and ripping yourself away from and connecting yourself to stuff and then live the fullest kingdom life that God created you to live. I want everybody to understand this. Kingdom living is not for heaven. Heaven is already a kingdom. What kingdom life is, is for earth. And God said, you just so happy to get saved. He said, once you become a believer, salvation allows you access to heaven and heaven is the Lord lowest level for a believer that is the guarantee of salvation but are you just going to wait for eternity or are you going to live like a king's kid in history and God says you don't get to inherit the kingdom of God all the things that I have planned for you all the things that I made for you before you were in your mother's womb if you keep doing the wrong things or going against my precepts or going against my principles that's why I want you to read relationship goals that's why I want you to get into my word that's why I want you to rewatch all of these series why because I want you to get understanding and a revelation so that you can do what I've asked you to do so you can inherit what the king has already prepared for you. Don't fool yourself. Somebody needs to put that in the chat. Don't fool yourself. Ah, I love it. It says 
Because most of us are like, okay, what do you mean do wrong? What is doing wrong? I'm glad you asked. Let's clarify. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, who commit adultery, who are male prostitutes, who practice homosexuality, who are thieves, who are greedy people. And I love that one because some of y'all thought y'all was getting out of it because you was like, nope, that ain't me, pastor. Nope, that ain't me, pastor. Nope, that ain't me, pastor. Then I said greedy and you greedy. And God literally saying if that spirit of greed and selfishness doesn't get out of you, you won't inherit the kingdom of God either. And that's the crazy thing about it. You heard homosexuality and male prostitutes and some reason for believers, you think that those sins are the big sins and they're going to be the ones that really do. But when Jesus sees sin, all of them at the same level. Baby, your little white lie is on the same level as male prostitution. And what God is saying to you is you better stop comparing yourself to one another. Narrow is the way that God has called us to live. I can't look to my left or look to my right. I got to be led by the Holy Spirit and walk it out. And that's why people are trying to figure out, is this sin? Is this doing wrong? Is this the one that's going to take me over? And God's saying, will y'all get off the line of sin and try to get into the life of success in me? Will you stop trying to figure out, can I touch? Can I finger? Can I this? Can I kiss? Can I lip? Can I dip? Can I... And we're trying to go and see what's acceptable so we can still do what God's called us to do. And he's saying, listen, those who are greedy people, drunkards, abusive, or use things for abnormal use, cheat people, none of these will inherit what the king has already prepared for you. Look what it says in verse 11. And some of you were once like that, but then you were cleansed. Oh, you were made holy. You were made right with God by your good works? No, by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Can we take five seconds and give God praise for his grace? Because some of y'all sitting there like you ain't never done nothing, ain't never thought nothing, ain't never been nowhere. But if it wasn't for the grace of God over my life that rescued me out of the lost dark pit, oh, somebody's getting a breakthrough. You're not where you want to be. But can we give God praise? You're not where you're used to be. Thank God for his grace. So crazy how Christians get amnesia so quick. You want to judge people who are in the middle of their process and you was just as broke up six years ago. Oh, that gave him too much credit. Six months ago. Oh, I gave him too much credit. Six hours ago. Some of y'all just made your declaration to God before the live stream. And God says, I'm good for that. But you need to judge others with the measure of grace you needed. Wow. Hey, I'm on your toes. <laughs> I'm in your business. <laughs> I'm in your house. And I know you don't like it. But I don't care. <laughs> I'm still coming. You don't see it. <laughs> you start running. I don't know where that came from. But it's time for us to live a life that is in view of God's grace for ours. Woo, I feel the presence of God. And I know what y'all are saying. This is what they were saying in Paul. Well, you say I'm allowed to do anything. But then Paul says, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. My question to you today is, what are you a slave to? And I just opened a big can of, can of worms because we're talking about sex and impure thoughts and sexual immorality. But my question to you is, are you a slave to food? <laughs> uh huh. Are you, are you a slave to people's praise? Are you a slave? What are you a slave to? God says the reason we got to get control of this body and you got to allow me to come in and you really don't at this time need to be joining with anybody else physically, emotionally, and spiritually because you got to get right yourself. He's like, this is why I'm asking you because what are you a slave to? And I, I can't, I don't even have time to go through all the things that we could be a slave to. But one of the worst things to be a slave to is sexual immorality. Because when you're a slave to that, it never comes alone. When you're a slave to sexual immorality, it brings all of his friends, lying, deception, manipulation, 
It, it brings abuse. It brings all of those things. When you start dealing in that stuff, even if we go back to David, who we were talking about like the past two weeks, when sexual immorality entered into his eyes through lust, when he saw Bathsheba, automatically he started manipulating. He started lying. He started up making up stories. Do, do y'all see what I'm talking about? You, you, you think that it's one thing, but it's like 50 things that come into your life. Excuse me. They don't come in. You invite them in. That would be like me standing here. Come, trouble, low self-esteem, insecurities. Come on. I want to be a liar next year. I, no, I want to manipulate my parents. I want, to, I want to tell them that I'm doing one thing and I want to do another. Come on. I want to lower my standard to satisfy a guy who doesn't plan to be with me for another six weeks. I'm going to give the best parts of me to a female that just knows I have a little money and wants a cloud jump. Come on. That's why I need to let you know this. I, I said all that to get you here. Write this down. Sex creates soul ties. Sex creates Soul ties. Let's break down that word soul ties. The soul, most theologians, theologians believe, is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Okay? So it's the mind, it's my will, my actions, what I do, and my emotions, my feelings. Ties, um, I think the easiest way to define it today, the culture is calling it entanglements. So it's my mind, my will, and my emotions entangled with somebody else. I don't think you got it. So I need to show you guys a picture of this because the problem is that many of us are walking through life tied to people, things, and ideas that had one space in our life. And maybe we didn't understand all of the ramifications of being joined emotionally, spiritually, and even physically through the act of sex. But God made this thing so powerful that he said it only needs to happen within marriage. And what ends up happening without proper revelation, we then do what feels right. And this is the thing that I need you to understand, that when you pay attention to your feelings, you're paying attention to your flesh. Your flesh will only tell you what makes sense in the moment, but the truth will tell you make what makes sense for your history and for the rest of your life. And what we do is we make decisions because it feels right. Pastor Mike ain't nobody. When he just talks to me in my ear, it just be making me like, <laughs> and, when, and when they text that certain thing, and when they do that, y'all know what I'm talking. Y'all gonna leave me up here talking by myself. And that's why you watch that show all the time. I just wanna watch power, Pastor Mike. I just wanna watch power. You need some real power of the Holy Spirit because those images that are going into your gates and the images that are going through your gates, there's a ton of people you need to unfollow right now because you're giving them access to your gates and you have no control over it. You think you have enough self-control to be able to do it, but one seed in your eyes can result in an activity six hours later. That one moment that, uh, that one moment that you just felt something can end up in you holding a baby nine months later. And it don't even look like you. This is what I'm telling you right now is that you have to get away from the soul ties. Well, Pastor Mike, that's easy to say, but you don't remember. You wasn't there when it was me and Rebecca. Me, me and Bex, this was my first. And I, I was scared, and she, she was more experienced, and I always thought she was beautiful. And, and, and it was that one night that we connected. And it wasn't going to be much. And I feel a little tug every once in a while when I want to study and be able to be, be focused, but... It was so good that one time that I, uh, I had to come back a couple times. And I'll never do it with anybody else because we had a special connection. And she had curly hair. And I think her eyes is hazel. I ain't never been with nobody had hazel eyes. But I'm going to follow God and do what he called me to do. And, um, but I can't stop thinking about that one concert we went to and what we did after it. My mind is entangled. And every time I smell that perfume, that's the perfume that she used to wear, and it gives me a feeling. 
And I just walked into the restaurant and somebody that don't even know me had that same perfume on. And it hit me because I was doing good. I was walking away. I was doing what God, but then I smelled it. And it took me back to a place that I've been tied up and maybe I can't live a Christian life. And maybe this is too much for me. And maybe, but I think I can walk away from that. I think I can walk away. I think I can walk. And then I, I went off to college or I went to explore and I really started going to another place. But I met this one friend that we started off in Bible study. We started off doing the things that God called us to do. And the thing that was initially attracted uh, 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 to me about her was how much she studied the word of God. And she went through a hard situation. And some of y'all are wondering, what's the FWB? Oh, we became friends with benefits. Like we'll never be official. It'll always start off as a Bible study. But it might end up with laying on of hands. <laughs> it might start off with us thinking about the future, but it might end up with us delaying both of our futures. And now every time I go to church, I'm not thinking about praising and worshiping God. I'm thinking, is she going to be there? When we talk about soul ties, the mind, will, and emotions being tangled with people. And now I try to lift holy hands. And there's restraint. Have you ever been in the house of God after committing something that you thought was sexually right in the moment but ended up being wrong? And it just feels like you can't worship right. And it feels like you don't got the right things to say. It's, dare I say, it's because you're tied. And it's crazy that many of you, you go to a place, you go to a place in your relationship where this is the sad truth for so many people, but there was a family member or a neighbor or a cousin who abused you. And you were never allowed to talk about it. And the one time you tried to say something, they made you feel like that would never happen and you were a liar because they liked the personality of the person, they never considered that they would be one who caused pain. Well, that's uncle such and such, and he, you know he would never do that to you. Are you sure he? And so what do you do as a child or an adolescent or somebody who was raped or you carry around, you hide that abuse. We never talk about it. There are people I feel the Holy Spirit right now under the sound of my voice that are sitting here over three decades of silence because you are abused and your husband can't figure out why you can't connect with them the way that he wants you to connect with them. Or you're a man and you are abused by another male as a young man and you can't figure out why your attentions don't get as attracted to a woman. It's because somebody robbed you of something. And now I'm trying to move in purpose and go for what God has called me to do. And I got my first, my friends with benefits, and my abuser still tangling up my mind, will, and emotions. And many of us, what we do is we get tired and stop. I don't want to fight this anymore. I don't want to keep going after it. You said it was the year of being stronger, and I feel weaker, so I quit. And whenever you become, become inactive, whenever you stop going after the things of God, whenever you stop fighting for purity, you give yourself an opportunity to be connected to somebody else. You know one of the, my favorite ones is the young people and, and even some of the old people who think that they can go ahead and start creating soul ties and have sex because they're about to get married. The wedding date is only three months out. You ain't even done marriage counseling yet. You don't even know what they come with. Well, we're deciding it's just going to be me and him forever. And the enemy tries to play you. <laughs> and what you now are, are, are connected to is someone who you want to have a covenant with, but the time has not come yet for you to honor that covenant. And what it does for most people is it complicates the 
the period of time where God's trying to get the last little stuff off of you, get that residue, let forgiveness come, and you're connected and tied to things that God's saying, if we're going to be doing this, if y'all going to be having sex for the rest of your life, what's three more months of consecration? What's, what's, what's six more months of preparation? And some of y'all honestly do need to move the wedding up because the sin is causing a setback in your life. And God's saying, I can't do everything for the business. I can't do everything. Don't fool yourself just because you made the date and you're still going against the rules that I've set for you as parameters. I cannot give you the inheritance I have for you. Don't fool yourself. And some of y'all, some of y'all older ones, who y'all can control your urge for six, seven, eight months, and then there's a cycle. There's like a week around your birthday. It's my birthday, so I'm going to turn up. And if I see somebody, I mean, I don't know what it might be, but it might be something good. And I don't, like, you do all of these little things, and you have all of these rationalizations of why it's okay. Some of y'all, you just continue to fall for setbacks. He tall. He handsome. I mean, what size shoe is that? Is that a 14? You know what they say about men with big feet. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all going to act fake with me? He got a beard. He look like you going to the NBA. You play basketball? You do? For who? Okay, cool. Can I go with you? Can I have Birkin bags and get my booty injected and get breast implants and be able to be your side chick? Can I? This life that I've been trying to live ain't working, so let me fake my way into a different life and become somebody I'm not to try to fit in with what is eventually going to be classified as a setback. Some of y'all have people in your phone that you need to go rename them setback. His name in your phone is Jerome. Her name in your phone is Alicia. You need to go in your phone today and you need to retitle them. Setback is calling. So every time you answer the phone, you know that you are potentially setting back the purpose God has for you. Setback wants to Netflix and chill. Setback wants to take me out for my birthday. Setback wants to talk. But no, I fasted, I prayed, I sought the Lord. The soul tie is broken. I'm going after you, God. Oh no, I'm going after you. But I couldn't get free completely. It felt like one came off. It felt like a little freedom. But I'm still connected to all of these people. Mentally emotionally and spiritually entangled. And now I want to lead a family. And now I want to lead a church. But can I expose probably the most covert assassin in the body of Christ? It's when you hook up with people who are kind of saved. See, the kind of saved people will trick you to feel like y'all have the same beliefs, that y'all doing a Bible reading plan together. But you know you can have sex between every Bible reading plan you do. <laughs> Planting images and thoughts and stuff they picked up from other people in different seasons. And now everybody is walking towards purpose and at any moment, I'm almost to the position or the spot I'm supposed to be at. I'm, I can see. I can see how God wants to use me. I can see that I have a call on my life. I can see I almost can write the book. The book is right there. I can almost be the one to change it. But I have not been loosened from the ties. Let me, let me give you the title of my message. It took this long. But the reason I'm so passionate about this is because nobody told me there's no condom 
for your heart. Everybody's concerned about sexually transmitted diseases. But the craziest thing that you can get is a spiritually transmitted dysfunction. There is no condom for your heart. We did it. We did it. We made it. But my heart was affected in it. And that's why so many of us are walking around thinking we're practicing safe sex because we wrap it up. There's no way to wrap up your heart unless you wrap it up in the word of God. Unless you have a standard that allows you to protect your heart. That's why the Bible tells us to guard your heart above all other things. Because out of it flows the issues of life. If I do not protect my heart and I allow all of these entanglements and all of these soul ties, my heart is the thing that gets affected. And there's no condom for your heart. The only way that you can actually practice safe sex is when you submit it to God. You surrender your sexuality. Safe sex, I made an acronym for it that's in the book. If you're going to have safe sex, safe sex means it's sacred. Safe sex means that it's anointed. And don't get all deep on me. All anointing means is God's approval. When he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, they had his approval for that. And God's saying, if you put sex in the container that I meant for it to be, you got my approval. It says the marriage bed is undefiled. Flip from things, swing from things, bring whipped cream and, 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 and whips and chains and, and hand sanitizer. Do it all. I mean, because it's undefiled because you're doing it in the container I put it in. But when you bring it out of that container, I can't put my approval on it. It's not anointed. So if you're going to have safe sex, it's got to be sacred. It's got to be anointed. It's got to be faithful. What if God was as faithful to you as you were to the partners you've been with? Let's be honest. Some of y'all are faithful to the same wife, but mentally and emotionally, you check out every day. What if God was as faithful to us as we were? He said, no, I meant this to be something that you consistently did. A covenant is not a contract. I need everybody to understand that. You can get out of contracts. A covenant is meant to last forever. A covenant is something, and that's why it always cracks me up, Charles, that people get married in the sight of God to make a covenant, but they go to the courthouse to, to, to get rid of the contract. They come before God to get married, but they don't go back to him when they want a divorce. Wow. Oh, you go to, you should invite all the same people you invited for your wedding and you should bring them up, bring the bridesmaids, the groom and everybody and say, we lied. We said till death do us part, but we really meant until they annoyed me enough. And they come to God for a covenant, but they end the relationship with the contract. I'm preaching right now, man. If you're going to have safe sex, it has to be sacred, anointed, faithful. And then watch this one. This is going to go against culture. This is going to buck every rap video that has you thinking around, I got three and four bees on my dirt. And this is what I'm going to do until it's out of bed. And you can swallow and blah, blah, blah. That's what we see. But if you're going to have safe sex, it has to be exclusive. Sacred, anointed, faithful. And exclusive. And the truth is, many of us are all tied up. See, the thing you can't control is when my friend with benefits hooks up with the about to get married and my first starts messing with my setbacks and my kind to save starts walking in abuse. Yeah, y'all, all y'all just switch up because they hooked up on a one night stand on spring break and then we were separated for a season and then what ends up happening is they cooked up with them because they met at the same birthday party. Yeah, keep entangling. And then they went from there to there and I'm still sitting here I'm really trying to seek God and go after my purpose and go do the things that God's told me to do and all of them, I can't control them because I left them behind and I don't have nothing with them anymore and then I said you know what this is the season I'm going after God and I'm about to move and look what has happened the entanglement is stronger now 
because it's tied in many places. My kind of saved friend, come on over here and get with the setback. And that's why, yeah. No, don't let it down. Don't let him down. Make him go through the hoops. And now that's why they think, no, y'all stay together because it's okay for men to be with men and women to be with women and people to go. And then that one time I'm just frustrated, then I, I'm back in it. And now what I try to do is convince everybody that, hey, y'all, God has a purpose for me. So let's make a deal. Since I can't let you go on willpower, can we just make a step towards my purpose together? One, two, three. Oh, that feels good. So I got to another level with the same setbacks. So maybe I'll just keep bargaining with all of the people and the emotional drama and the hurt. Hey, guys, can we take two steps forward towards my purpose real quick? One, two, three. One, two. Oh, my goodness, look how much I'm doing. Look what God's doing in my life. This is what Facebook and Instagram looks like. This is how God is blessing me. And look, I'm on vacation and all this stuff, but you still all tied up. <laughs> and what happens is, because we've made some forward progress, still tied emotionally, spiritually, and physically to people. And then what happens? Hold on. Then what happens? Yeah, come here. Yeah. And then God shows me, stand up there by the podium. And then God shows me who I'm supposed to be with. Just stand there. And the reason I can't go after who I'm supposed to be with, because if you knew what I was still tied to, this is what, you don't talk about this on your first day. Many of you got married and don't even know your partner's past. Because if you knew what I was tied to, you, you might not even consider me ever again. So let's keep lying. Let's keep the truth in the dark. Let's not submit it to God. Let's act like it never happened. Can I tell you a secret to all the people who want to get married? You do not get blind, deaf, or dumb when you can have sex legally before God. If you do not check the perversions and the thoughts and the intents of the heart before you get married, all you did was invite somebody in so you could hurt them. So what do I do, Pastor Mike? Thank you. What do I do? How do I get in, uninvolved? How do, how do I come back to a place that I can get back to spirit and truth? That I can get to my purpose and my destiny? How do I get untangled? I need you to write these points down real quick. Because I'm not going to show you all of this and not give you practical steps of how to get it. If you need to go, peace. But there's somebody whose whole life is depending on this message hitting the heart of their situation. So I got to give you solutions right now. If you want to get untangled, the first thing you have to do, I'm going to give you these C's. You have to cut it, call it, confess it, cancel it, and cast it. All these ties individually, I have to cut it, call it, confess it cancel it and cast it. I'm going to give you one minute on each of these. You have to cut it. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it says that you need to run from sexual sin. Not walk, not ponder if this is a good thing or you can handle it as a man because I haven't seen breasts before and I haven't seen booties before and I, I haven't been to the strip club before and I haven't done this before. No, 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 no. Run from sexual sin. And many of us are walking and jogging away from what God is asking us to run from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you got to cut it. It's got to be a clear cut. I'm no longer doing this. If they're there and it's there, I'm running the opposite direction. And people are always like, but I, I want to be friends. They're good people, though. I really want to be friends with the people that I caused myself to be depleted from. And I know there's all type of philosophies on this, but if you check the health of the relationships you want, is it worth cutting it? And the Bible tells you it is. Run from it. And then you got to call it. See, call it is, is one of those things that I need to help people because a lot of people will get out of the relationship, but then they romanticize it. Like, man, there was some bad stuff that happened, but they were the best person I ever been with. And we try to make this picture of what it is not. And we try to make it be like, yeah, I mean, it was crazy. But I remember that one time and we try to replay the good memories and romanticize it. You need to call it what it is. It was a thief. It stole your time. They stole purpose from you. They stole. Nobody makes friends with a thief. And there's people out here saying that people who stole for them was the best thing they ever had. You need to cut it and you need to call it what it is. Then you need to conf confess it. According to James 5 to 16, you need to confess your sins to each other, not to the pastor, not to the leader. He says, go find another fellow believer. That's why I always encourage you. You're the minister here. If the church shuts down forever, it doesn't matter. You can call or FaceTime or get around one believer. And it says, I can, you can get healing from this stuff with one other believer. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Because the earnest prayers of the righteous person, people who are in right standing with God, not perfect people, but the righteous has great power and produces wonderful results. Who have you told what's actually happened to you? What you've actually done to others and what you're actually thinking about doing. If you would get that honest and that real, real there's husbands and wife that need to have real conversations there's kids that need to have conversations with their parents. Why are you saying this? Because God only can change things in the light. He only can heal things that are revealed. And many of us are not being healed because we will not reveal. We want to move on from this point. Like, that's in the past. We're just going to start from here. But the past has a hold on you. And you can act like it doesn't. And you can act like you're moving forward. But God's progress for you is way up there. And you're still fighting to stay right here. So you need to cut it, call it, confess it. And then you need to cancel it. I like this one. Because have you ever seen a TV show that was on the air and they would uh, actually um, um, give advertisement for it and they would plan for it and send flyers and do Instagram posts and all that other stuff? And if the show doesn't work, they say they cancel the show. And at the moment they cancel the show, all the advertisements stop. Everybody is disbanded. There is no more connection to it. People disassociated with. That's what you need to do in these relationships. Some of y'all have ended the relationships and you still running the reruns right now. You're still going back to the situations because they were cool with my family or they just a fixture in our household. I mean, they a cool person. You need to cancel it. Give them back the Jordans they bought you. Give them back the necklace they had. I don't want any remembrance of this time. Well, it's the most expensive thing that you ever had. Baby, you don't know you're the most expensive thing that you've ever had, that you're a kid's, a king's kid. You're valuable you're worthy until you understand that you're worthy you won't cancel the things that God has asked you to cancel you cut it you call it you confess it you cancel it and then you cast it this is the one I like first Peter 5 7 says cast all your cares your anxiety your mistakes on him why because before you cared about it he cared about it and more than he cared about it, he cared about you. So God's saying, I don't want you to spend the rest of your life carrying your mistakes. Carrying what's going on in your life. And that's why when we get back to Paul, talking to this church in Corinth, he says, I know culture's telling you one thing. I know culture's telling you. That food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. That means I got urges. I got stuff. You know what I'm saying? Men are made for women. Women are made for men. Like, I mean, this is true. Though someday God will do away with both of them. We'll be just spirits. 
that you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about your body. Some of y'all have believed the lie that this is just my body. I'm not hurting nobody. Like this is, you know what I'm saying, just how I get through and express and relieve myself and dot, dot, dot. And God said, man, I care about that too. I care about everything. I made you. I, I need you to cut it and call it and confess it and cancel it and cast it. If I could sum all of that up, God wants all of us today to surrender our sexuality. Everything that we were taught about it that was not founded in the word of God. Everything that we've experienced, everything that happened to us wrongfully. God said, I'll take all of it. You can surrender your sexuality. The husband and wife that right now the passion is gone and you just feel this distance that's coming between you. God says, hey, surrender it to me. I can make you have the best, most passionate sex life at that age that you've ever had. But you cannot do it alone. You got to surrender it. The young man, the young woman that's watching this right now, and it was a decision between turning this message on and looking at pornography again. Let me say congratulations. You made the right decision. And there's tons of other messages just like this that can help you hide yourself. How does a young man or a young woman keep his way pure? Psalms 119. By hiding themselves in the word of God. God is saying, if you surrender it to me, I can help you with this. Some of you have images and preferences and struggling in sexual identity and Am I attracted to men? Am I attracted to women? Can I do this? Am I transgender? What do I, how do I, can I? And God says, I'm not scared of none of it. Bring it to me. Surrender all the wild thoughts, all the hurts, all the abuse, all the entanglements. Give them to me. Because I care about you and I care about your body. I had a struggle with this as y'all know I tell my testimony every week that I was addicted to pornography I was tangled up I had all kinds of stuff that was holding me back God was trying to do major things in my life and I was tied to so many people and so many ideas and so many pictures and you know what this does it makes you tired and I feel like there's so many believers right now that it just said, I'm tired of fighting this. Because you tried to do it on willpower. And I'm just going to. If God wants to use me, he's going to have to come get me. I'm not fighting this no more. I'm sick of trying to do it. And God's saying, exactly. Are you sick of trying to do this on your own? Are you done with trying to do this on willpower instead of real power? <laughs> Can I tell you the real power of God is so powerful? Let me show you. It's hard to do normal things. It was hard to get up because of what I was tied to. There's some of y'all, it's hard to do like normal stuff because of what you're tied to. But can I tell you what real power will do for you? In 1 Corinthians 6, 14. There's a revelation in here that changed the trajectory of my life. This is how I got free from all of these bondages. And he was telling these people through Paul, and God, who? God, not you. Not your meditation, not your good thoughts, not your staying just uh, under the radar. Like, you're going to need real power. And the real power comes from everybody say God. God will raise us from the dead by his power. Just as he raised our Lord from the dead. And I saw that and God said, there's your answer. And I was like, I don't get it. You know, sometimes one of, one of the things that you do in meditating is you go over the same thing over and over. That's why in Psalms it says, I meditate on your word day and night. Some of us just read for sport or read to get a streak. And God's saying, you're, 
you're moving past the revelation that'll change your life. Maybe some of y'all this week need to stay on one scripture every day until it starts to say different things. The Bible is the only book that you read and it reads you. And when I did that with this scripture over and over and over, this is the revelation I got. Verse 14, it says, and God will raise us from the dead. Okay, so he's going to raise me from the dead and I'm going to go to heaven by his power. It's going to be his power that raises me from the dead. Just as he raised the Lord from the dead. Like that's what he did. He ascended from the cross and you came from heaven to earth to show the way. Okay, in front of the earth. Okay, I see you did that. What does that have to do with me? And God said to me so clearly, like I'm going to say to you, Michael, if I can raise a dead body, what makes you think I can't manage a living one? He said, if I can raise every dead body, if you would allow me, if you would surrender your sexuality, I can help you manage the one you got right now. And how is that going to happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, I'm trying to, I hear your message today. And there's some things I was planning to do before I got here. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm making a decision that I'm not going to do that no more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender my sexuality. Okay. So I'm coming after you, God. 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 But I can't seem to get past this point. And God said, are you done? Because at the end of your rope is where my power gets seen. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe for some of you right now, the power of the Holy Spirit is coming as you surrender. Come on, lift your hands. The power of the Holy Spirit is coming to cut you free from every time, from everything. And God is saying that no matter who it was, you can be free. I feel the presence of God in this place right now. Whatever was tied to you, whatever was tangled up, it now becomes your testimony. You can stand up and say, I used to be a hoe, but now I'm holy. I used to, ah, I used to feel worthless, but now I'm worthy. I feel the presence of God coming to you wherever you're at right now. Come on, hands lifted up all over this place. We're about to surrender our sexuality. Come on, hands lifted all over this place. God, I'm available. I surrender everything to you, God. My will I give to you. God, if this is what you're saying, I'll do what you say do. God, I'm asking you to use me. God, I can't do this by myself. I'll use it all. I'll use my testimony to show someone else the way. God, I just need your power to enable me to say, to be real, to confess it. Somebody say, say, my story is empty and I am of a... Get Caleb a mic to you. Come on, I feel the presence of God in this place. Lift your hands right now. I need you to lift your hands. God's coming in and he's doing surgery right now. Somebody say, say, Lord, I'm available to you. Come on, somebody is, is getting transformed right now. Said, my will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Come on, somebody say, say, use me, Lord. God, we need you. To show someone the way. Come on, we need you, God, right now. And enable me to say. Come on, somebody, hands lifted up right now. I can't do this, say. My story. I'm done. Say my story. It's my story. Somebody needs to say it. I'm done. There's nothing else I can do. And I am available. Today to end service. I believe the end of service is the beginning of surrender. I said, I believe the end of service is the beginning of your surrender. And I want us to pray a prayer together. A prayer of sexual surrender. If you have the Relationship Goals book, it is in this book. 
And I pray this prayer often and I want to pray it with you and pray it over you today. And I want you, if you got the book, it's on page 117. And if you don't have the book, we're going to put it on the screen or on the lower thirds or something, but I'm going to lead you in it. But today, wherever you are, I want you to lift your hands. I believe God is doing a miraculous work that soul ties and things that have been connected to you for years. Are, mm, 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 mm. I feel the presence of that. There's a push coming to your house. Come on, there's a push coming. God's saying that this is not the end for you. This is not all she wrote. But on 2,000 years ago, God wrote a different story for you. And all you have to do is receive it. And all you have to do is surrender. Repeat after me. Say, God, I don't know how to do this on my own. So I'm giving you my sexuality. I have done things, said things, experienced things that I know were outside of your will for me. And today I'm asking you, whoo, take ownership. Come on, that's what needs, somebody needs to say. Today, I'm asking you, take ownership. I want to live a life of value. Come on, say that. That is centered in your love for me. And not my desire for temporary fulfillment. Reset my priorities. Come on, everybody, say that again. God, reset my priorities. Refocus my thoughts on faithfulness. Renew my mind with your identity for me. Rebuild my self-worth until I believe that I'm your masterpiece. I feel that somebody right there, God is about to rebuild your self-worth. Everything that's taken all the pieces, he's rebuilding your self-worth. He's taking all the pieces and making you a masterpiece. Realign my perspective to see myself and others the way you see us restore my broken pieces and make me new i give you permission come on this is important right here if your heart is not open god is not gonna knock down the door and come in you have to give him permission somebody say it from your heart i give you permission to uproot my damaged areas somebody say it again i give you permission to uproot my damaged areas of rejection, pain, hurt, shame, guilt, and the bad examples that negatively shape my perspective. And I'm asking you, come on, lift your hands up. God, I'm asking you for you to cultivate in me the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5 that will produce, say it out loud, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I surrender my sexuality. I'm yours in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you would seal that prayer over my brothers and sisters. When those watch this on the rebroadcast and it's shared three, five, ten years ago, I thank you that the same spirit that is with us in this room and it with your people at the house, it invades their house, invades their car, invades their heart, and transforms their life. Today we surrender. We surrender our sexuality to you, God. Purify us, oh God. Search us, oh Lord. Thank you, Father God, for transforming us. Sex is not bad. Sex is good because it's God's idea. And thank you for the container of marriage that will allow us to succeed. I declare a peace coming over your life right now. Some of y'all, this is the freest you've been in a long time. Don't fight this moment right now. God's healing deep things right now. There's, there's deep things. I, I don't want people. We're so quick to move, and I know the stream is long. and It doesn't matter right now. How much does your healing cost? 
Come on, just let God do this work. Some of the memories that are coming back right now, God's saying by his Holy Spirit, he's severing it right now in the name of Jesus. I feel the presence of God in this place. Ron, God, people are healing. They're being, stuff is snapping off right now. I feel it. Stuff is snapping off. You won't have the desire anymore for it. You won't have the taste for it. The appetite will be gone. Well, what do I do tomorrow when something comes up that I didn't know I was going to see? Surrender it again. This is not a monthly or a weekly or when we do a sermon series. This is a every day. Today, God, I surrender my sexuality and I give it to you. There's some people watching this stream and you've been tuned in all of this time for this moment. You remember when I talked about a covenant and how there had to be bloodshed when a covenant was made? Well, I want you to know that God does not want to be separated from you another day. Actually, not another moment. Because he wanted to make a covenant with you. He sent Jesus Christ, his only son, to the cross to shed blood. And the Bible tells us that he knew we were going to make mistakes. And he was wounded and bruised for our iniquities and our transgressions. He said, somebody's got to prove that there's a covenant so I'll give my life because Michael's going to be addicted to pornography and he's going to need a way to get back to God and so I'm going to make a way and no matter what you've done, how far you feel, how broken you feel, no matter what people have told you or even religious people have told you, God's saying that he loves you and he made a way for you guys to be connected and all you have to do is accept and receive, not by your works but through faith what Jesus has already done for you. If you want to make the greatest decision of your life, the decision that untied me, the decision that allowed me to go from being a manipulator and addicted to pornography and lost and broken and jacked up, not even that long ago, that took me from that place, not to a perfect place, but a progressing place. And every day I have to surrender my sexuality. But God says, that's my boy. One who works and walks in progression, not perfection. That same level of access is available to you right now today is the day of salvation some of you have been like Lord, let me get my stuff together there's a few things that I need to do before I come to God let me help you you can't get it together without God you cannot do this without him you need his help so today if you want to make the decision for Jesus Christ according to Romans 10 9 all you have to do is believe that Jesus came he died and he rose again just for you and you are saved and what does this do? This makes you have an understanding that I'm repenting. You repent. All repent means is turn. I'm turning from the way I dealt with sexuality. I dealt with people. I talked about people. And I'm turning to God. I'm turning to his word. I'm finding out what the manual says about my life and my situation. I'm finding out what the spirit of God has said. What he said over me before I was formed over my mother's womb. And we want to help you with that. We want to walk with you. But this entire journey starts with a decision. So if you want to make that decision, we're about to pray. And you saying, Pastor, I want you to include me in that prayer. A week ago, we had over 600 people get saved in that week because they came to a moment like, oh, yeah, you can clap. You can shout. That's why our church exists. We had over 600 people in one week give their life to Christ because they said, I don't want to do this. I want to surrender. And today I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's drawing you right now. The reason I'm taking some time with this, because it's been taking you 30 years to get to this point. And God said, give me three minutes and I'll transform everything. I'll turn this thing all around. One, you're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, I am so proud of you. But more than that, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Three, if you want to give your life to Christ, come on, lift your hands in your living room, in the porch, running. It doesn't matter. Lift your hands. I don't see you, but God does. You can put your hands down. I even know tears are flowing right now. There are people that things are changing around right now. These are the moments that your life will be defined by. And I want us to pray as a church family. We pray at Transformation Church as a family for the benefit of those who are coming to Christ. So everybody in your homes, in your car, watching on replay broadcast, on your, um, at your cubicle, I want you to pray this out loud. Say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to shed his blood just for me. Today, I surrender. I believe you lived, 
you died and you rose again just for me just the way I am with all my ties with all my baggage you still love me today I give you my life be my Lord and Savior change me renew me transform me I'm yours in Jesus name amen can we give God praise all over the world I said can we give God praise all over the world I don't feel like people just got the ties cut off of them I feel like some people are getting new clothes I feel like some people are taking off the old garment and they're switching the garment of heaviness and you're picking up a garment of praise. I dare you to give God a shout of praise. The only time that I bring this around is to give somebody a testimony. This is who I used to be, but for the grace of God, I feel this thing in here. Y'all better stop. I, I felt a push right there. Something just pushed me. But somebody's got to know that any man that be in Christ, you're a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, everything is new. And God is bringing that to your life. I'm trying to quit. I got goosebumps though. Hear me. Don't walk this out alone. If you just made that decision for Jesus, he doesn't see you how you see you. He sees you through his son, Jesus. So when he says, uh, didn't DJ do last week? I can't see it. Because all I see is Jesus. I see the cross. Like, well, didn't Suzanne, she just, just hours ago, she was playing it. I don't see Suzanne. I see Jesus. And when I see Jesus, I see a perfect lamb. When I see Jesus, I feel this thing. I got to share the gospel with you. When I see Jesus, I don't see your mistakes and your mess ups. I see you through the lens of my son. And when my son died for your sins, he also took the penalty of it too. Woo, woo, woo. If you just gave your life to Christ, I want you to text the number on the screen. Let us know. We want to send you some resources and some information. We want to help you pick out your new clothes. We don't want you to think that this is the only thing you have to wear anymore. Thank you so much for watching this message. And if this has impacted you in any way, I'm asking you to do a couple of things. Number one, join Transformation Nation. Join us right here every Sunday. Gather your friends and your family and be a part of not just this moment, but this movement. The second thing I would ask you to do is share. Share this with your friends, your coworkers, people that are around you, because transformation is just one click away. The last thing I would ask you to do is partner with us financially. If this ministry is impacting your life, transforming you, I would ask you to consider, pray about what you could give to help us take this message to the whole world. I want you to know that we love you and your best days are right in front of you. This week, I want you to live a transformed life. See you next week.